Blue Note Records is, I think, one of these great American stories. Blue Note was, a, was totally what you would call an indie label. It was started by these two guys who came over from Germany in 1939 and, and just loved American jazz. Alfred Lyon and Francis Wolf coming to America, finding and being attracted to these African Americans playing this music in the late 30s, you know, deciding that they should wholeheartedly document this process and this music because they heard it a different way and then followed its trajectory for 75 years. Now up till today is, a, is quite an achievement. What makes Blue Note un unique is the, the premise upon which it was started in 1939, which was to capture um, music in its truest form. And I think Blue Note's gone through many, many uh, changes over the last 75 years, as music has. In the late 30s, um, jazz began developing uh, at, a, at a rapid rate, and a handful of jazz fans uh, started to do independent labels. The first one was Commodore in um, 1937, and then in 1938, HRS, and then in 1939, Blue Note. And these were labels that were created by essentially hobbyists that knew nothing about the record business but learned very quickly and wanted to capture the music the way it really sounded. Alfred Lyon attended a, a, a very historic and integrated concert at Carnegie Hall in December of uh, 1938 um, called Spirituals to Swing uh, that John Hammond produced. And among the artists on the show, uh, it was, the show covered lots of forms of black American music. And um, what excited Alfred the most was the boogie woogie piano playing of Albert Hammond's Mead Lux Lewis and Pete Johnson. And two weeks later, um, he had raised enough money to go in the studio with Albert Ammons and Meadlux Lewis and recorded like 25 or 28 uh, solo and duo performances by the two of them. And then Blue Note was born. The, uh, the founders of Blue Note in 1939 left a manifesto, good old lefty man manifesto. <laughs> and uh, it's just a couple of short paragraphs, but it basically identifies the notion of making uncompromising music that's rooted in authenticity. To continue to keep the energy, that much passion and energy, in a, re in a record label is, I mean, this is the recording industry. It's very easy to lose passion in the recording industry. And Blue Note has really consistently tried to maintain that integrity, that level of excellence. Um, and that's what we need to celebrate. If you, if you go back, to uh, Alfred Lyon, you know, who started the label. If you go back and look at the musicians he signed. He signed, you know, he made records with Thelonious Monk. He was the first guy to record Monk. That's the most outside, still to this day, you know? Even though he's, again, he is what he did harmonically has permeated the vocabulary of musicians. That was revolutionary music. When he started the Jazz Messengers with uh, Horace Silver and Art Blakey, that was a revolt against the rules of bebop. Art Blakey was throwing backbeats in on the hi-hat and everything. You didn't play a backbeat in bebop, you know, that was, and Horace Silver wanted to do these kind of funky, gospel-influenced licks that would have gotten him kicked off the bandstand at Minton's, but that was, now you listen to it now, it sounds very inside because it became an established part of the vocabulary. And people keep changing it. You listen to what Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter were doing on, on their mid-60s Blue Note records. And it's, that's, ra that's a radical departure. It's rooted in tradition. All these things are rooted in tradition, but it's completely reinventing the tradition. I can only speak to the 60s in a very personal way because I came of age in the 60s and it was a time when music, rock and roll and R&B and jazz was changing. And what was changing was that the anger and the frustration that a lot of us felt socially and politically was creeping into the music because a lot of musicians felt just as enraged and frustrated. They were a part of the movement just as much as Martin Luther King was, you know. They were the sounds of this movement. Musicians like Max Roach really kind of put it forward that we want freedom and we want, we want it now. John Coltrane, you know, writing songs like Spiritual or Four Little Girls, dedicated to the 
the girls who were killed in the bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. Charles Mingus writing a song about the kids in Little Rock, Arkansas trying to go to high school and his distaste for the governor, Governor Faubus. So Charles Mingus, this great bassist and composer, writes a song called Fables of Faubus, all about this you know, unrest that is happening. The music of Blue Note is about change. It's about constant change. It's built into the DNA of the music. And so if you just keep rehashing something from 40 years earlier, no matter how magnificent that something may be, then you're totally denying the true spirit of it. And people who try to defend jazz by saying, no, these are the rules of jazz, they've already missed the first rule of jazz. <laughs> it just don't make any rules. It's, it's always been about revolution. The phenomenon really exploded when, when Lee Morgan came back to music actively in the end of 1963. They came back to Blue Note and he cut an album and um, one of the tunes was a, this 24 bar blues called The Sidewinder. And it was just another album. They didn't, Lee Morgan didn't know, Alfred Lyon didn't know, but it exploded. Um, the, the day it came out, it exploded. It just went through the roof. Um, and became like the first really major hit for, for Blue Note. The 45 of it was in jukeboxes everywhere. It was on TV commercials. It was all over the place. And it was on the pop charts in the, you know, in the top 20 uh, albums. And it just resonated with people and just became incredibly popular. And then about a year later, uh, Horace Silver wrote a song called Song for My Father. That became an enormous hit as well, uh, ubiquitous, uh, on the pop charts and everything. And what happened was, at that time, Blue Note was an independent label and success threatened its existence. It, it just couldn't survive because um, in those days, records were distributed by independent distributors and um, the distributors stopped paying Blue Note for their records unless they had a hit. So they they would be like delinquent in their payments and Blue Note almost went out of business as a result of its having two big hits. So they sold the company to a larger label at the time, Liberty Records. And after a year, uh, Alfred Lyon found it crippling. He couldn't stand it. He was a nervous wreck. He couldn't work for other people, so he, he left. Francis Wolf stayed on and ran the label for another five years. And then Francis died of a heart attack in 1971. At that point, the, uh, the label was owned by United Artists Records. At the same time, uh, there was a lot of financial pressure in the, in the record industry in general, but especially in jazz. What kept Blue Note going was that Donald Byrd, who had been on Blue Note for 20 years at that time, produced an album called Blackbird. It became phenomenally successful. And that kept Blue Note going for another few years. The jazz side of Blue Note was fading away. By the early 1981, Blue Note was just dormant. I got a call from uh, Bruce Lundvall, and he said, I'm going to take a job with the MI. They want me to start a New York pop label, but as part of the deal, I told them I want to reactivate Blue Note Records, and you know, so I want you to be involved. When we revived Blue Note in 1985, Bruce said, how about, you know, well, you know what, let's do, a, let's do a concert at Carnegie Hall or Town Hall or somewhere and we'll, we'll get um, all the great Blue Note artists that are still alive and still playing well and, you know, we'll, we'll do a whole history of the label and we'll have some of the current artists. We launched the label with this Town Hall concert one night with Blue Note and, um, and we just kept putting out reissues and kept signing new artists and signing a lot of artists from the classic Blue Note era. That's how Blue Note got revived. You know, in the 90s, there was this thing where Greg Osby and us three really consciously trying to approach hip hop in a way, which I think is a total predecessor to what Robert Glasper is doing now. Mm -hmm. is, is Greg Osby in that time was working with CL Smooth, and us three kind of had this remix of an old Herbie Hancock song, Cantaloupe Island, and they called it Cantaloupe or something like this, yeah. which became an enormous <clears throat> kind of also a uh, hit, kind of remix hit of the song. Cantaloupe, it just was, oh yeah, absolutely, this is great. You know, it was just an incredible uh, use of music samples and DJing and rhythm. And we wholeheartedly wanted to put it out. And, but we didn't think it was gonna be a big hit. 
you know, that was... Yeah, it's like the equivalent of, like, Sidewinder, like it was on television commercials. Yeah, it was every, it was ubiquitous, yeah, you know. When I was hired, I was hired first to be the chief creative officer of Blue Note Records, and the assignment was, uh, was very abstract. <laughs> there were a lot of people in the in the EMI Corporation, who owned the record at the time, who, there was a lot of talk about closing the label down, making it a website that sold catalog and blue t-shirts. But there were a few people, most notably Dan McCarroll, who were not happy with that idea. They wanted to keep it going as a new music source. Now, I was in New York City, I was producing John Mayer, and we had one night off. And I, I went up to 106th Street to, to hear a singer named Gregory Porter, who I, I was just a fan of his. I'd never met him, had no professional association with him. I just went to hear him sing. And I sat there for all three sets, eating ribs and drinking coffee. And the next morning, I was having breakfast with my friend Dan McCarroll. And we weren't even talking about music. But at the end, at the end of the, the breakfast, I, I said, do, do you still have Blue Note Records as part of Capitol Records? He said, yeah. I said, well, you should sign this guy that I saw last night, Gregory Porter, because he's amazing. And out of that, it, he offered me a, a job because that was the only, <laughs> only positive creative idea he'd heard about Blue Note Records. The job was really to identify the aesthetic lying, that lying beneath the music on the label. What tied it all together? What became clear was that the label was about revolution, and change and being radical. It seems that every in every decade, Blue Note finds kind of miraculously a hit shows up like here. Yeah. You know, um, Nora Jones comes into the office. Oh. I remember. I remember when the the demo came into the office and people were just sitting around. And they were listening to it and I was like, wow, it's pretty good. And then a year later, you know, her it's like boom, this hit comes out. So Robert Glasper, you know, been on the label for a couple of years and he does. Black Radio Part One, you know. Now that there's Part Two coming out, he does Black Radio, you know, and then here he is winning R&B Grammy, you know. Nora Jones wins, you know, Best Artist of the Year, you know, that year that her record came out. It's like somehow Blue Note becomes this label that can always keep its its ground fertile with all this kind of weird music we all make, and then somebody just like just that they've already been working with just places here's the next big thing and then it just and it becomes you know a it real sound is, yeah there's a sound there's a blue note sound that was kind of what we were looking for initially like in, in like i said in the 60s there was a blue note sound that's easily identifiable there's now a, a 2014 blue note sound that that you don't hear on any other coming from any other labels it has to do with the unique musicians that are signed to the label. By Blue Note staying on its course and being a, a, a passionate, pure operation, it, it's a label that people respond to deeply and I think it attracts uh, every generation and it attracts artists of, of real substance. They can trace the lineage of the music back. You couldn't have Robert Glasper's music without Art Blakey. So, Let's investigate Art Blakey. I hope it leads him into everything. I hope that through the music we're making today, we can draw new people and to understand the tradition that, that as cool and radical as Glasper's music is today, that's, that's what Art Blakey was in the 1950s and the 1960s. It actually always was. It's some, it's some kid out here right now, out there, some right now, who has this idea about something they are, are facing as an issue, as a challenge. And if you see that if there are enough pathways that you've seen other people go down, then hopefully that becomes the inspiration for you. The whole idea is to, is to keep it moving forward. And to keep it moving forward, you have to have new people coming along who, who, who know the traditions in order to, in order to break them, you know? And that, that's really what it's about.